Hello and welcome to this week's bonus episode of Planet Critical, a podcast for a world in crisis. On this week's episode, I interviewed Dan Fiskus. Dan's an engineer and he then later retrained in life as an ecologist. Along with Brian Fath, Dan wrote the book Foundations for Sustainability, a coherent framework of life-environment relations. Now, I'm not going to go into a, um, a massive intro about what that is because that's all over on the episode, but essentially Dan came on the show to discuss the argument that him and Brian lay out in his book, which is showing how science is a huge driving factor in the climate crisis, that the paradigm of science is not equipped to deal with crisis, that it is itself in crisis, and that rather than popping up as a crisis of science, uh, which has happened in the past. He talks about like when relativity came along and those, uh, or when you know the Earth was flat and then it wasn't. <laughs> he says that rather than seeing um, this crisis as a crisis in science, it's kind of been transplanted onto the environment because of um, technology. Essentially, what Dan is proposing is that science has to be infused with values and ethics. That being value neutral is one of the reasons that science. <sighs> is being used to drive all sorts of, I mean, A, harmful practices, although I suppose um, that's my value judgment on certain things, but um, knowledge at all costs, that we're not prioritizing correctly what we should be researching, um, and we're certainly not prioritizing science that encourages the relationship between life and the environment as inseparable, rather than seeing uh, life as a capital L as something that can go on without environment. And he uses this great example and eagle-eared, <laughs> no, not eagle-eared, um, sharp listeners will notice that Dan and Carl from last week, who spoke about how Western philosophy was driving the climate crisis, they use the exact same example. That for people who think we're not dependent on our, on our environment, hold your breath. See how you go without oxygen for more than four minutes. Unless you're a swimmer, then do it for ten. There's this really funny moment in the episode when Dan brings that up. And then he says, you know, you're connected to those green plants. And I went, oh, damn. You know, I knew that where he was going was with, you know, you can't live without oxygen. So to think that we're sort of independent beings is sort of un unfactual. But I hadn't process that next step of where oxygen comes from so I'd fail to see the the ecosystem in its entirety just with that minor example like of course oxygen is essentially that bridge of relationship between plant life and humankind and any other uh, creature which requires oxygen which is you know all of them I just think it's quite a good example of how our perception of the natural world can be quite reductionist so much so that even when you're trying to retrain yourself to to think about systems and interconnections it's really easy to miss simple steps or at least it was for me so dan talks about how the current science paradigm is reductionist objectivist analytical and mechanistic and he then talks about donna l meadows work who was writing in the 70s about limits to growth which is amazing and he mentioned a paper that she wrote top 12 sources for leverage for changing a complex system and that the points one and two the top two points were about paradigms if you want to shift a complex system or if you want if you want to change it, if you want to adapt it, you have to A, understand the current paradigm with which people are viewing um, that system and then B, find the points of leverage where you can change that paradigm. I find that really, really interesting because when confronting the, the, the pff, okay, the, the climate crisis, the ecological crisis, the biodiversity crisis, uh, he calls it the meta crisis. You know, it's cultural, it's economic, it's uh, social inequality. We are looking to science to provide the solutions and the research with which we can mitigate the damage to the environment. I mean, I think we're pretty much all on board with that, right? It's better that than being a climate denier, but maybe there's secret options number three, as one of my friends likes to say. We have been looking to science for a while um, and science isn't always producing the best things. Like, you know, moving to electricity, making our power electric rather than fossil fuel dependent. Well, that's all fine. It depends how you're A, making your electricity, but also B, for anybody that's been listening to Planet Critical for a while, every expert says that the electricity does not have the same power as fossil fuels. The electricity can never be used to power the world in the way that we are that it's going to require a dramatic uh, reduction in our energy consumption, which is, you know, which could be a great thing. But even if we were to attempt just transitioning to electricity, the amount of um, the world's surface that would have to be covered 
in wind farms and and solar panels and grids as well to to get electricity to wherever it needs to be and uh, huge ginormous batteries that are actually impossible to create with the amount of uh, minerals and metals that are currently on the planet to store that electricity for when the weather shifts um for you know those in the north like me, <laughs> no sunshine. Even in California, they couldn't depend on solar energy during their winter. And, you know, it's like summer all year round there, it seems. So there is this striving for solutions in science, which is fantastic. But without infusing ethics and values into the paradigm itself, Dan says, I mean, we're not going to find the, the solutions there because we might continue to invest in, in the wrong kinds of research that might be about maintaining humankind's position as dominant rather than seeing humankind as a part of a larger ecosystem of life on this planet and devoting science to figuring out how to support that life with a capital L rather than to just support humankind's development at all costs. It's a very interesting proposition. He makes this amazing point towards the end about what we can learn from space travel, which sounds so ironic, right? But he says, you know, when NASA sends up a rocket into um, space, they quite literally have to think about the environment that will sustain that team of astronauts for however long they're going to be up there. So there has to be enough food, there has to be enough oxygen, there has to be enough water, it, there has to be moist disposal, <laughs> etc, etc. But essentially, that is a really key example of how life and environment are interdependent, and how man cannot live without an environment upon which to depend and work with, create with. And yet it is that kind of final frontier of exploration that is typically seen as like, you know, the billionaire cowboy race, in which there is that biggest acceptance and confrontation with our, our dependence on our environment. I find that a really interesting way to, to shift my thoughts about space travel. And I really enjoyed how he separated um, NASA from the billionaire cowboys, <laughs> the kind of research that they're doing. You know, not all space travel's made equal. <laughs> I would be really interested to hear from others in the scientific community what they think about Dan's work, what they think about this idea of paradigm shifting and what they think about, you know, even just the concept that perhaps there's something in science that is driving the problem as well. Joshua Farley, um, a couple of episodes back, made a really interesting point that when you study the um, politics of economic students, after four years of doing an undergraduate study in just, you know, standard economics, they quite literally become more neoliberal um, and more conservative. Their, their politics shift through studying uh, economic frameworks and economic modeling. So I can imagine that hearing a critique of um, how science works when you've been in it for a long time would be very, very difficult. Uh, so I'd love to hear from everyone who agrees or disagrees. Could it be that the culture of science itself needs to change? And I mean, why not? I have so many economists on this show saying e economics needs to change. It, it needs to be value-based. It needs to be ethical. It needs to be about um, building communities and sustaining life and being in tandem with ecological systems. So why not? Why can't it also be that the culture of science, the paradigm of science needs to shift. Food for thought. And I'm going to leave it there now. Uh, definitely go listen to the episode if you haven't already. To my patrons or anyone else watching, thank you for tuning in. Please do let me know what you think of these bonus episodes and the podcast episodes. Email me at rachel at planetcritical.com. To learn more about the project, you can go to planetcritical.com and you can either subscribe there to get the podcast episodes delivered to your inbox every week or you can subscribe over on the YouTube channel. I would ask if any of you are enjoying the project, please do consider supporting Planet Critical here on Patreon. And to those of you who are already supporting the podcast, thank you so much. This work just wouldn't be possible without you. <laughs> thank you all for watching this little bonus episode. I hope it was valuable to you in some way and I'll see you next week.